So hi everyone, welcome to Canadian Consortiums. I'm uh, Frank McCallum. I'm the Associate Principal of Vista Virtual School, which is an online school that covers the province of Alberta. I'm also the chair of Canny Learn, which is something that uh, my colleague Randy will be spoke, speaking about in a second. Just a quick note that the session is being recorded and recordings are available through July 30th. They should be available a few hours after the end of the session. Uh, you can post all your questions in that discussion area and uh, a few of us will be monitoring the chat and we'll try to answer your questions as we reach the end of the, uh, the presentation. So uh, Randy is uh, sharing um, sort of our uh, opening page and we have a, just a little um, motivator to get you thinking as we move on to the next slide. And so what, what you see in front of you are a number of uh, people who cover different areas of Canada. Uh, basically, we each have, we're each from different provinces and so have different experiences with uh, um, various models of collaboration in the distance and online setting. And we'll hopefully answer some of your questions or give you some ideas or you'll give us ideas to take back. But uh, to kind of start off, we should talk about, I've mentioned Canny Learn here. Uh, I'd like to hand it over to Randy to talk about what Canny Learn is and who we are as an organization sure. in, in, the, in the country. Sure, thanks. Before, before we do that, maybe why don't we just go around the, the, the room a little bit. For those of you that are in the audience, if you go over to the polls, you'll see there's a couple of questions there that uh, you can take your time in terms of providing some answers, but takeaways just so it keeps us focused on what it is that we want to do. So I'm Randy Labonte and I'm the CEO of Canny Learn, although we're, we tend to be a very small organization um, working uh, collaboratively and collectively together. So we are a consortium, uh, which is, I guess, part of why we're together and uh, looking forward to describing and discussing with you a little bit more about some other consortiums. But uh, so uh, might be Michael, Todd, Bruce, and then Michael Barber maybe can do some quick introductions. So who's who in the room? All right, I'll start off here. I guess we'll go from east to west uh, for a change. Uh, hi, I'm Michael Canu. I'm the CEO of LEARN. LEARN is a nonprofit educational organization located in the province of Quebec. And I'm right now coming to you from uh, just north of Montreal, where the temperature is uh, a humidex uh, factor of about 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm. Hot. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Randy. Uh, my name is Todd Pottle. I'm, uh, I'm an administrator, high school administrator here in Ontario, but I'm on secondment as the executive director of the Ontario eLearning Consortium. We're a consortium of 35 school boards here in Ontario that share courses, share students. We'll talk more, a little more about that later, how we're organized and how we operate. Um, not originally from Ontario, though, originally from the great province of Newfoundland. And if you've never had a chance to visit, I hope that you do. Bruce? Hi, I'm Bruce Weitzel. I'm the executive director of uh, the Western Canadian Learning Network. Um, we are a consortium of about just over 70 school divisions across Western Canada, and we focus our attentions on building tools for schools working online and in blended situations, in particular the digital media and course media required for K-12 education. I guess that would be my turn then. I'm Michael Barber. Um, like Todd, I am originally from the great province of Newfoundland and Labrador of uh, come from away fame, which is how most of the Americans tend to uh, know who we are, uh, if you've seen that Broadway musical. Um, and right now I am in Vacaville, California, because I'm at Toro University, California. And he reads a lot, as you can tell. So... Thanks, guys. Uh, and we have a, a small audience, so we're trying to be as interactive as we possibly can without you guys grabbing a microphone. Um, but just a little bit about our, our group. We actually uh, formed um, in by meeting at the INACL Symposium, which now DLAC has formed as well. So we've got a, a pretty close relationship with, with John and Allison and others that have helped us to sort of grow what became the Can -E -Learn, Canadian e-learning network. So we're focused on K-12 and online and blending. And uh, as a result as well, we've really found a bit of a niche for ourselves in terms of looking at research, sharing resources, and PD. 
Uh, we continue to try to come together annually, but we also support a lot of the provincial activities. So Candy Learn is a bit distributed in that sense. Uh, and we've really tried to take an active role, particularly with the policy changes and some announcements, but also in pandemic to ensure that accurate and well understood uh, theories, knowledge and, and expectations around what really in, entails e-learning or online learning is clearly communicated because a lot of misconceptions and notions are part of that. Um, do want to apologize, I forgot to say that unfortunately, Brian Carpenter is not available, uh, both as well as uh, Joelle Nagel. Joelle Nagel is later in the uh, agenda program on the Wednesday, I think it is, uh, as well. So get a chance to meet her then. So we've been together. We are very much um, a, an organization of, of the volunteerism, shall we say. So we started way back in 2008, we can trace it back, uh, and we then met in Toronto to decide how we might want to organize ourselves. We had several meetings with folks, uh, Allison Powell, Don, uh, as well as is, uh, John Watson was in there and others, Matt Wicks uh, at iNickel at the time. So we decided what we needed to do was to actually get together and continue to meet, but in Canada. Although we do find ourselves connecting in, again in US events and, and others. So we also have been inclusive by ha having the Francophone community join in with us. And then we started a, an annual symposium, but we found that that was really much more provincially centric. So we've actually moved on to looking at a leadership summit, which has been virtual and will be virtual again this year. Uh, but we're looking forward to continue to grow more into the professional learning uh, domain and opportunity, very similar to uh, following some of the similar paths that DLAC is doing uh, as well. So one of the things that we have done is we partnered with Michael Barber. Michael Barber is our honorary life member and continuing to be a, a, a strong volunteer and supporter. Maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the research that we've wound together. Uh, certainly. So um, as you can see from the screen there, Candy Learn has been a partner with us for the annual State of the Nation project. So for those uh, Americans in the audience, if you remember back to when John and his team were doing the Keeping Pace reports, um, and now the, I guess his DLC have been doing for the last two years, and I know they're working on the third one now, the snapshot reports that look at essentially the level of activity and the nature of regulation uh, that exists on a state-by-state -state basis. Well, the, the State of the Nation, uh, reports, they do the exact same thing on the Canadian front. So they go province by province, territory by territory, and outline the uh, various um, the, the various activity that's happening, both on a distance online and blended aspect, as well as the nature of the um, regulatory regime that each of these provinces or each of these uh, jurisdictions have. Uh, in addition to the annual report, we've also done a number of individual reports, and I'd encourage you uh, special topics reports, if you will, which is something actually that John and his team started doing around the same time that we started uh, them. So we've looked at things like um, e-learning class size. We've looked at things uh, like how funding has been done um, at the uh, uh, for K-12 online learning in the, the, the literature. Um, the most recent one, which seems to be our most popular one thus far, uh, looks at the differentiation between online learning, emergency remote learning, and remote learning, as we've been trying to take apart some of the things that have happened in the pandemic. And uh, if you haven't seen that one, it's probably the one I would recommend the most. If you go to that website, just click on research reports and all the special topic ones are at the bottom there. Um, I think that's about it, Randy. I don't know if there's a remote learning one coming up next. Uh, yeah, thanks. And, and just to, so you know, in terms of the, the mosaic that we live in, and you'll hear more when we get into specifics uh, in each of the provinces, but the provinces and territories all have slightly different approaches in terms of what they do. And some have uh, just district-based uh, programs. Some have a sort of provincial oversight that's part of this as well. And Atlantic Canada on the far right and Newfoundland, Labrador, um, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and P Prince Edward Island, they are a little bit smaller in terms of geography and numbers of students. So they tend to operate with a central program, uh, mostly only. 
Uh, and you'll hear a little bit from Todd because Ontario being the most populated uh, province, which is dead center and just below uh, the uh, Hudson's Bay and James Bay area, um, has variations, again, based on geography, based on past history. So that's a little bit of the context that we're, we're looking in uh, for us uh, now. So in terms of where Michael had mentioned the different reports, so you can find them all on our Canny Learn Research Project site uh, that's there. And uh, there's some interesting ones that might give you a little bit more of an in, uh, a, a sense in terms of what's happened with us. So we're gonna start in the West. So we started introductions from the East to the West. Now we're gonna start in the West and we'll start with Bruce to give us an overview about a consortium uh, for the Western Canadian Learning Network. And Frank, I'm, I apologize, I'm taking over hosting, so I'll stop. <laughs> Quite all right. Bruce, <laughs> the floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Randy and Frank. And uh, I'll just uh, give you a bit of background on the Western Canadian Learning Network. We were established out of uh, an organization uh, known as Cool School. Uh, cool School started in the, uh, I guess it would be the uh, late 80s, um, and was developing uh, basic materials predominantly on a, uh, a paper format initially, and then it went to a digital format. Um, it was passed over to our local provincial government. Uh, they tried a couple of approaches to things, things fell apart and their vacuum was created. So in 2006, uh, myself and a co-founder in Kelowna, in the Okanagan Valley, uh, approached our superintendents and uh, expressed a, a need to develop uh, some kind of a consortium model again in British Columbia and we were established as, at that time, British Columbia Learning Network. Um, effectively, it was set up to establish the, the, the digital media, the learning media for students. And at that time, we were focused on the grade 10, 11, and 12 curriculum in British Columbia only. Um, it soon grew to approximately 20 school districts and we uh, began to develop uh, larger databases and learning object repositories for online learning. Again, strictly in British Columbia. Um, finally, in uh, around 2015, um, we expanded our operations across Western Canada on the invitation of various school divisions in British Columbia, sorry, in the Yukon Northwest Territories and in Alberta. And this year, um, things blew wide open with COVID uh, and we were getting calls from all across Canada, but we limited our scope to uh, Western Canada simply for management purposes and the fact that each province in BC has different curriculum and trying to manage all of those elements are quite a challenge. You can see some of the member districts within our, our, our core group. Uh, this is a, a fraction of who we currently serve, um, but effectively some of the largest school districts in British Columbia and um, some of the largest programs uh, in Saskatchewan and Manitoba as well, and uh, some large ones. Um, effectively, the consortium was established so that school districts could pool their finances and leverage their expenses. So by investing five or $10,000 in a year, they would receive the equivalent of 200 this, this year, about 400,000 in development uh, going out the door and uh, constant renewal of the resources as well. I think the key to our growth has been the fact that we're an organic uh, organization. Uh, we work directly with our teachers and administrators in the schools on practical solutions for online learning. And uh, so our regular meetings and surveys out to our teachers and administrators, school administrators, uh, really asking for input into uh, development goals and directions. And as a consortium, everybody owns the, uh, the elements uh, that we develop as long as they're uh, members of the, of the consortium. This year's goals, based on input from surveys related to the LRI, sorry, LOR, uh, Learning Object Repository, and LTI updates, uh, working on uh, catching up some of the uh, massive growth we've had in the last two to three years. And uh, we evolved into K-3 resources this year as well. And, and that's a direct result of COVID requests. Um, prior to this year, we were only organized down to grade four, and the, the K-3 resources were in huge demand as emergency remote learning took hold across the country, um, and particularly amongst uh, some of the newer members that were really seeing some major impact of COVID in parts of, uh, parts of Canada. Um, I think one of the things that um, 
we also do uh, in a fairly significant way is we customize our work. So we work with local jurisdictions to do curriculum mapping to make sure it fits their needs. And of course, we're also hiring teachers from each of the individual provinces and technicians to focus in on the needs locally within a provincial curriculum mandate. Um, we also add, uh, or, or we create partnerships with organizations that add value to membership. So if there are a need for a particular type of curriculum or something that we can't provide or we're not expert at, we will reach out to uh, particular partner organizations and negotiate uh, special rates for membership uh, in particular. Um, you can see a slide a little bit later on that speaks to that. We also try to focus on maintaining affordability for all. Um, we're not profit focused. So we do provide uh, support for the smallest programs and smallest districts. Um, I think our smallest uh, group, uh, to my knowledge right now, is about 30 FTE equivalent students, which equates to about 200 courses a year. Um, and so we provide discounts to make sure that that's affordable for them too. Uh, basically, when you, you buy a membership into the learning network, it's all in. You get everything that we have available to, uh, to provide to, for your program and services. And we also focus on uh, quality resources. We have specific standards within WCLN and common formats to make sure it's an easy transition for students from course to course. And um, how do we control it? Oh, sorry, there's a question coming in about quality control. How do we control it? We vet everything. So everything that we develop and work with is are vetted by our, our uh, contracted uh, employees who are teachers in the jurisdiction that they're being vetted in. So quality control standards are set up um, specifically uh, by us and then managed specifically through contracts that we, we let to uh, focus within. We also have the ability to modify curriculum instantly. So if we get a call tomorrow that they've, someone's discovered a glitch in the, in the curriculum or the digital media, we can uh, resolve a, a solution within about 24 hours, which is quite helpful. And of course the LTI functionality has been a key to that process. And then finally, I guess, uh, because we own all of our original content, um, we are able to uh, adjust and evolve what we do uh, regularly. Uh, we are not beholden to any provincial government, which is key. Therefore, we're not caught into um, politics of the day as they swing between various uh, governments. Um, we work closely with local bureaucrats. We work closely with government representatives, but we maintain our funding model through the schools and their districts um, who have uh, a little more um, appetite to make it work for their teachers and their programs. And I think uh, the last few slides just show some of the things that we're working on. Um, you can keep flipping through Randy, I think, and uh, showing some of the things that we've done. We've built a, a game generator software so that teachers can actually take it and it'll walk them through questions and, and support and elements that they can actually build their own. So these are all built by teachers, practicing teachers. The inquiry projects, we hire uh, various uh, professional groups that uh, are expert in inquiry uh, development. And uh, these have become some of our most popular elements within our curriculum, uh, K through 12. And uh, here's some of the folks that we're working with currently. And uh, some of them you may have heard of, Dave Weese has worked with New York uh, uh, State Jurisdictions and the TC Squared is out of UBC uh, in Vancouver. Um, so uh, again, very, very much about uh, trying to tie back to uh, uh, grassroots folks that are experts in their area, Teresa in terms of science and medicine circles. And we're working more closely with Aboriginal communities now to, uh, to um, zero in some of their curriculum uh, focused uh, more locally on their needs. And then this year, actually, this number will double. Um, we're actually spending a lot of dollars right now on video tutorials to give instant feedback to students. So once they've completed an element, um, uh, a learning activity, and they may have discovered some errors within their uh, assessment, they can actually see where they went wrong, wrong right, right away and practice if they need to. So it's a form of uh, in reinforced mastery learning and uh, highly popular with teachers uh, across the network. Um, we have massive 
test banks. Um, of course, testing isn't as, as predominant in our practice as it used to be, but uh, um, we're in the, yeah, I think 10,000 is a little on the light side as these slides are a little old, but I think we're closer to 20,000 uh, elements across all curriculums. And that allows uh, us to generate uh, unique uh, tests for each student, as opposed to uh, those that may try to cheat off of uh, a friend who's taking the same course at the same time, and their assessments are different. So it, it, it eliminates a lot of the attempted um, fraud that, that can occur if you're not careful online. And then finally, a big focus on blended learning. Uh, for the last uh, six, eight years, we really shifted a lot of our work to ensure that our resources uh, work with the classroom teachers as well, who are choosing to go down a blended path. And of course, highly successful with remote uh, emergency remote learning as well. Um, a lot of uh, different elements in there that are zeroed in on, on uh, blended teachers and uh, obviously develop with their support. Some of our partners uh, currently, and uh, again, um, we, we have developed some software, significant software. One of our elements is a management tool uh, that, that is, uh, works with any LMS uh, for onboarding and assessment and reporting uh, back to parents and has live portals for parents to be able to view uh, what's going on with their student at any given time. And uh, I know there are other elements out there. The difference here is we own it so we can customize it based on, on the, the needs of our, our membership. And finally, we have regular meetings with our teachers, face-to-face -face meetings when possible. And uh, we focus in on the core elements uh, and we would, some of these folks are our leaders and uh, they help guide us towards um, um, our, our, our final product. Uh, actually no such thing as a final product could be constantly improving and evolving it. These are all practicing teachers in the field across uh, the provinces. And just some speaking notes that I've been uh, speaking to. Bottom line is that uh, the, the plan that we forged uh, in 2006 has taken hold across, uh, across Canada, in particular in the Western uh, provinces. And it really is replicable, providing that you focus on the organics and uh, make sure that the teachers are in the mix and we can uh, grow ultimately uh, the value of this for membership uh, as long as uh, folks choose to support it. Thank Great. you. Thanks, Bruce. And and uh, Brian Carpenter was going to speak to a little bit in terms of what's going on in the professional pieces. But what's interesting is, is uh, again, there's a bit of a, an opportunity to, because Western Canadian Learning Network really focuses on curriculum. Uh, Kenny Learn as a partner in with BC and, and uh, Western Canada stays away. And we do stay away from curriculum, focusing on PD and research uh, in that area. It's a bit of an overlap, but together, uh, in sort of a, a mishmash or remix, if you like, of a number of different groups, uh, two of them uh, teacher-led, one of them administrator-led, uh, the other independent school or private schools, uh, as the, the case may be, as the other term, but in BC they're called independent schools, come together collectively for a, an annual event, which uh, again, consolidates the field, allows for interactions and exchanges as well as and our corporate education partners as well are part of that whole mix. So while not technically a consortium, it is a very much collaborative kind of opening and structure. And my own takeaway from BC, Bruce, back in the early days was uh, when the, the online schools were first uh, made available in, in policy and legislation in British Columbia, it was kind of like Tijuana market time because the course funding followed the student. But, and so because of that, a lot of the schools believed they were competing with others and they didn't want students to you know, go to the other school and they'll take the money from the ministry. And so it was a bit of a gong show uh, to start with, but at the end, everyone sort of came together in a collaborative structure, which was fascinating to watch that evolution, but that it still has continued, including with the public and the independents who often are looking to uh, enroll the same students. So it's a bit of a, an, an understatement about some collaboration and I probably have rose colored glasses on for that. No, that's uh, pretty accurate. I think uh, we coined the term coopetition uh, in the province of British Columbia because we started off competing and recognized that we were stronger together in all elements. And this is where the, 
the conference and, and the consortium grew from. But, I mean, that, that's essentially what's happening in Alberta is that we're just getting into that, that second, that phase that you're talking about. So, I mean, consider this the Canadian geography lesson. If you go east from British Columbia, you're going to get into Alberta. And in Alberta, what we've had happening, if we can move on to the next slide, Randy, is a sea change in how distance education is funded and structured in the province. And that's going to have a ripple effect in terms of our collaborations. So there's been a lot of back and forth around how these collaborations and consortia have worked in Alberta. But the, the key driver is that they've always been driven by individuals, student um, teachers or schools that have a desire to, to make connections with others. It's never really been um, a push from a more systemic level, in part because there's always been a central hub provider of distance resources and services. And that was funded by our Department of Education. Well, they made a decision to close that. And while it may seem odd to do that in the middle of a, of a pandemic, that decision was made some time ago and is simply being carried through. And what's happened instead is um, the government has chosen to fund individual school jurisdictions to establish or set up their own schools, as well as independent and private schools. So in many ways, we are now in a position that British Columbia was X or Y number of years ago. And the big question is what's going to come about in terms of the, the collaborations or consortia. Already what I'm seeing in some of the social spaces, uh, the social media spaces, is this notion that there is competition. That is certainly the feeling at a lot of uh, school division offices is that this online school is going to be competing with that online school. So these informal collaborations and consortia that have been happening, they've been kind of rising, then falling, rising, then falling, depending on the interest of the individual school or uh, teacher. At first blush, it seems like those things are going to be sidelined for a while. I feel like we're going to be heading into the same situation that uh, uh, Randy mentioned with regards to British Columbia, there's going to be this notion of competition for some time. And then it's going to, you know, as Bruce said, get into the, what was it, cooperation or cooperation, uh, whatever that term was you used. I think that's where we're heading. But I feel like if for the next year or two, we are going to be in a very interesting siloed space in Alberta. Now, the, the province next to us is Saskatchewan. And the big rush, the big issue that they're running into because their, their representative wasn't able to join us is simply that they're, they're modeling between the emergency remote learning because of the pandemic and the more systemic uh, uh, distance education. So they, they really need to land on what model they're gonna have based on their enrollments. So in terms of what they're doing, obviously they're going to be uh, trying to build on what they've learned from this sudden influx of online students, but they're not entirely sure if that's a sustainable set of online students or if this is pandemic only online students. So I don't want to give them short shrift, but I want to move to Ontario because Ontario is a big place, Todd. Great, thanks so much. Uh... Bruce, thanks, Frank, and uh, thanks, uh, Randy, as well. So hi again, everybody. So my name is Todd Pottle. I'm the, uh, again, the Executive Director of the Ontario eLearning Consortium. There's our website, and uh, there's my email. There's my Twitter account. Please follow me. I'm trying to get up to 10 followers by the end of this year. So uh, with you guys signing up, I'm sure I'll be able to uh, make that milestone. Next slide there. Okay, so this one this is a little bit different because I'm, I'm not going to be talking so much about resources, uh, which was absolutely fantastic to uh, see what's happening with, uh, with Bruce and his organization. I'm going to talk more a little bit about structure and, uh, you know, how things are structured in Ontario because it is a little bit different. And uh, so over here, I don't want to give the idea that there's a, a dichotomy here because I'd like for you to think of these two sides working together. Um, so we have the Ontario Ministry of Education, and uh, part of the Ontario Ministry of, of Education is TELO, Technology Enabled Learning Ontario. So they're responsible for everything with regard to the integration of technology into program. Um, and a part of that is full-blown e-learning. Oh, you want to go back a slide there? Thank you. And they have a, a manager, education officers, and they work directly with school boards, and they also fund... Uh, what's called a TELT contact. So every single school board, 72 of them in Ontario, 31 of them 
public boards, 29 of them Catholic boards, and then 12 of them are French boards. Uh, they all are provided with a TELT contact technology enabled learning and teaching contact. And I was one of those people many, many years ago before I went uh, into admin. So the, the ministry side here, they, they provide the provincial LMS, learning management system or virtual learning environment, whichever you like to use. And so uh, licensed for every school, every student throughout Ontario is Brightspace's D2L. That's integrated with our various SIS systems such as Trillium, Maplewood, uh, PowerSchool, now and an Aspen, which is becoming very popular. Um, they also author content. And that's something that makes us a little bit unique when compared to other jurisdictions across Canada, is that they do provide digital content for all of the courses. And, and it's, um, the courses are already, you know, courses are already activated, students are already enrolled, so you don't really have to do all of that. All of that's happening in the background through the integrations. And all of our kids have single sign-on that kind of get them into their full suites of GAF and L365 and whatnot, and also into D2L's Brightspace, where all of their courses work is and whatnot. So, you know, pivoting to remote, because we've had three closures now, right, in Ontario. And uh, during each one of these, we had to, uh, you know, to pivot to our learn at home programs, remote learning. So it was very advantageous to have all of that stuff already set up. Uh, so then we have, so here's us over here. But again, I can't emphasize enough, don't see this as being separate, even though it would appear that way, because we're actually employees of schools. I'm still an administrator with a Ontario school board, but I'm seconded into this position. So, and the, this is the way the e-learning the e consortia works. So we have uh, the OELC, which is the largest, the one that I'm the executive director of. We have the OCELC, which is a Catholic version of us. And uh, is we do still have that uh, dual system here in Ontario with the public and the Catholic system. And we have our French folks, the uh, Cabal Faux, and uh, they, we all you know, structured pretty much the same way. We work with directly with school boards, but we work more with what are called district e-learning coordinators. So you have your TELTS, integrating technology, all programs, and then you have your DELCs, which are strictly looking at that full-blown e-learning. So in terms of my world, the pandemic changed very little, except that now I had to jump over here and we had to start supporting all of the uh, Learn at Home programs and uh, the, uh, the virtual schools and whatnot that had arisen in each of our boards in order to meet the needs of our remote learners. So uh, that's enough on that, Randy, if you want to jump to the next slide. Okay. So we've been around ever since uh, 2005, and there's 35 school boards right now. I won't bother following the link. Um, so that's 35 out of the 60. 50 cent, so that's 57% of all non-French boards are actually members of the OELC. Uh, it's optional, right? It's optional for board. some boards, or like a really large board like Toronto or York, uh, may be able to or, or feel that they're able to provide enough e-learning courses to meet the needs of all of their students. And if you can do that, great. You know, maybe, you know, you don't need a consortium as much, but there's some peripheral benefits of a consortium I'll talk about in a second. We have small boards. We have <laughs> Northeastern Catholic has one high school. It's a very small board. And we have large ones like Peel uh, District School Boards has 59 secondary schools. We're urban, we're rural. And we are right across the, all regions of the province. And Ontario is a very large province. So geographically, we cover a lot of area. And the, you know, for any of you who are a little more curious about the, uh, the consortium model, it does have equal advantage irregardless of the size of the board. Just want to move ahead. So here's the, the whole fundamentals. Why did you guys start a consortium? And it comes down to, you know, a single board can't possibly offer all of the courses that all of its students need. It's impossible. I mean, you know, you can offer uh, some of the courses, but you know, if you're looking at your students would require access to 168 different courses. You can't offer 168, nor would you have the student population in order to fill those up. So uh, in order to meet the needs, you know, diverse needs and uh, pathways of all of our students just makes you know, sense to follow the consortium model. And then of course, you know, it improves equity of access to students, course options, flexibility, better accommodating varied pathways. But one thing that we had found when we did a little study a while back was that it moved a lot of part-time students to full-time status. So I was once an administrator, very small high school. We only had 300 students. E-learning was very big for us. We had an e-learning hub in the middle of our school. And so the because we were able to now provide all of these options 
which we would not have been able to provide in the past. We were able to bump up some part-time students to full-time students. And that's great because, you know, it helps them obviously. And we also increase our funding. So we don't have any, there's no fees, right? There's no money movement of money. We have students who are coming in and students who are going out. So if you are, you know, on a particular board and you're hosting e-learning courses, these courses are now available to all of the member boards of the consortium. So you have students coming in to fill your available seats, but you also have students who are going out in order to take the courses you're not offering. We have to develop some software that keeps all of that evenly balanced. We don't have to worry about sending money all over the place, invoicing, tracking, accounting. And then there's the whole pooling of expertise and stuff, which uh, is a whole session in itself. If we could just move on. To the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, we're growing uh, and not just because of the pandemic, again, the pandemic had very little impact on us in terms because our operations continued as usual. Uh, 12 new boards in the last two years, we uh, 154% increase in enrollment. We'll have this year alone, 62,500 course completions. And that doesn't include the tens of thousands of people who are in our remote learn at home programs during, uh, who chose not to go back to school during the pandemic. Uh, and then consistent low rates of attrition, high rates of success. Next slide. So just to show you kind of graphically what that looks like, that's kind of how we've grown over recent years. Uh, click again, please. And you can see our enrollment has grown and our attrition uh, has kind of uh, leveled out here. Next slide. So my last slide is just, you know, basically everything that we do operates around uh, a very, you know, complex and robust and purposeful piece of software that we've funded and developed called PRISM. Works alongside all our SIS systems. We use it for registration, communication, tracking, reporting, et cetera. We also have three groups that keep us going. Our operations group, they work at a procedural level who I meet with regularly. We have our members, one for each uh, school board and they have voting rights. And we have our executive committee, which is the executive committee. Um, are, they're basically superintendents that are elected into these positions. Among, there's five seats that are available and uh, that's the committee that I work with most closely. They, they kind of direct the things that I do. PD events, we offer boot camps, we have ops meetings. We just finished two versions of, uh, or two instances of Vault virtual online teacher training series where we had about 1200 uh, teachers during uh, each version of it, one in October, and then another one again in February, uh, attend month long webinars. And then uh, in our in-person conferences, Bolt, bring online teachers together conference. We offer that in Toronto and Ottawa each year, obviously not during the pandemic. And we work a lot on with focus groups. So as you can see here, course writing, we're looking at doing a, a French content writing initiative coming up this summer. We've got attrition, attendance, community, and engagement are all the types of things that we have focused on over the past year. So um, yeah, anyway, did not want to go too long on any of those, uh, but I will uh, turn it back over to our host. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. And we're gonna keep moving to the East. I realize we're getting nearer the end of our session, but uh, Michael Canwell in uh, in the Belle Province of Quebec. Thank you for, uh, for being there. I will quickly switch to English. We have five minutes left. Um, if you wanna know about LEARN itself, I urge you to go onto our site, www.learnquebec.ca, and you can look at the um, uh, About Learn portion. Uh, we are a consortium where uh, we serve the uh, linguistic minority within the province, and um, we have been around since 2005. Rather than getting into the structure of our organization, because we do serve the, all of the English community, we have to collaborate naturally with uh, our, uh, the French majority here, they, uh, they are uh, the dominant force, uh, obviously, and without uh, collaboration, uh, we would never be able to do anything with them. Um, oh, okay, just a second. How much time do I have here? Is it 75 minutes or do I have five minutes? Yeah, you've, got, you've got plenty of time, Michael. We, we're not, uh, we uh, still have the discussion. <laughs> okay, I was trying to get this down to four minutes, five oh. minutes. All right. Um, well, then let me just uh, highlight, really, because we are a consortium and we do serve all of our boards across the, the, the province, we're able to offer certain resources and services that otherwise we would not be able to. And I've start, wanted to really start by focusing on what we've done 
uh, in the uh, the whole tutoring uh, online tutoring session. Uh, in the last, uh, I was going to say, year and a half during the, the course of the pandemic, um, parents have obviously been very concerned about uh, keeping their children up to speed and uh, not um, uh, fighting off what, what they're concerned is learning loss. And they're get into that discussion later. But that was a, a major preoccupation with uh, uh, with parents. And so we opened this up um, and put a lot of our focus on really serving that uh, that particular community. And we've actually this year alone served tens of thousands of, uh, of students across the province uh, and doing it. Um, we have about 140 uh, uh, tutors working for us. And this is something that we brought on really recently just to, in, to respond to it. Uh, and but it doesn't happen if we don't have our boards working with us, our consortium uh, working as a unit. Uh, our tutorials actually are offered in half hour sessions. They are given uh, to students really with a, uh, an idea to either remediate, complement, supplement, um, and enrich uh, what goes on in the classroom. Parents are given a, um, at the end of every week a, a report on their, their progress. Uh, that report is sent to the teacher and the, the school principal, and we work really as a, as a unit to try to uh, serve the, the, those particular needs of the, stu of the students. I forgot to mention that everything that we do is free. We, there's no charge for anything we do because we're a nonprofit organization. And of course, that appeals to parents because uh, typically tutorial sessions in our neck of the woods cost anywhere from $45 to $75 an hour. Um, yeah, and, and uh, I was going to just uh, go a, a little bit more on the tutoring, but the, our tutoring team is growing. And ironically, one of the most interesting things that has happened this year is that our, our tutoring team, uh, almost a, uh, in an organic fashion, has become um, a professional learning community of sorts. They uh, come to uh, work together uh, and they start to share, they're sharing resources. These are all, by the way, teachers who are full-time teachers during the day and who uh, tutor in the evenings with us and it's a chat with them to supplement their incomes, et cetera, et cetera. But um, they've uh, come to uh, really understand and uh, know what online learning and teaching is uh, all about, how they can effectively engage them in, in that particular environment. So it's been very, very effective. Um, as I said, they really have come together as a unit and, and it wasn't anything that we had planned and yet here they are working together. they are teachers who are, um, uh, from all over our province. If you go from the east of uh, Quebec to the west of Quebec, uh, it could be a three hour, four hour flight. And if you go from the southernmost point to the northernmost point, it's a five, six hour flight. So um, uh, we, we cover a vast territory and these are teachers from all across the province uh, and serving teach, uh, students in this uh, particular area. This is something that parents absolutely love. And as I said, it's, it's a result of being able to work as a unit, and this is the, one of the big advantages of our consortium. Uh, and as I said, it becomes a learning experience for our, our, our tutors as well. So uh, maybe the next slide, uh, Randy, please. The next one I wanted to highlight was my good night bag. Now, our, my good night bag is um, a program that we put together with community partners. And I, and I wanted to highlight this because we have 90 community learning centers across uh, the province. These are um, uh, schools that have partnered with uh, community uh, uh, agents, uh, organizations, in order to offer a, a wide variety of, uh, of services and resources. We've always felt that the, the problem when we look at it, schools is that it's uh, considered a, almost like a building, it's four walls. Um, our community learning centers really expand that whole thought that uh, uh, notion that we really go beyond four walls. The, uh, the, the world is the, the uh, area in which our uh, students can learn and our community is welcome to, to come into it. So um, the Good Night Bag was really an opportunity for um, our parents within the, the community to come into the schools, to work with uh, agents and, and teachers and specialists in the field of uh, early childhood literacy and to really uh, allow uh, students uh, uh, children really more in this case, uh, uh, an opportunity to uh, develop uh, some of those skills that will prepare them for, for school. Once again, uh, I wanted to highlight that this is a, um, an initiative that brings together external uh, partners with parents, with teachers, with uh, school administrators, and, and we do this across all of our school boards and all of the districts. 
Um, it's again one of the strengths and the advantages of working as a consortium. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the other thing that we do, and uh, I should highlight this, is that uh, uh, we do probably more professional learning and offer more professional learning sessions uh, to our teachers than any other organization across uh, our province. Uh, um, I think this year we'll have done more than 10, well, I forget how I many exactly, but thousands of, of sessions uh, with, uh, with educators and we provide them an opportunity to really learn things hands-on. Um, we've been driven by a curriculum since 1999 that's competency driven that's really uh, focused on experiential uh, project-based learning and we struggled a little bit with that uh, uh, to be honest with you but um, we continue to offer sessions where teachers are actually uh, uh, involved in as we, we mentioned it here hands-on learning it happens across uh, our province in all of our, uh, our our communities this is especially useful for us because we have uh, teachers and educators who are uh, in remote areas in certain cases and other cases working with restricted uh, budgets and can't move around. We do a lot of these online. In other cases, we actually pick up our, our uh, staff and uh, they'll go into the schools and, and work uh, together. Uh, I, I'm not saying anything shocking when I say that very often uh, uh, teachers uh, come uh, go into schools and the, their first instinct is to uh, go and walk into the classroom, close the door. And if you're a school principal, your first instinct is to shut your, your school down and, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, we've really worked hard with our, our teachers and our, our principals to offset some of that closed mentality that, uh, and, and become much more collaborative in nature. So, uh, oh, my dog is snap snoring in the background. So I'm just, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, uh, yeah Terry, shh, shh, quiet, quiet, stop snoring. Um, I didn't realize he was picking that up. Woo, that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, yeah, so what we do is we really do work in a, in a hands-on uh, environment rather than trying to uh, create resources that are, uh, are there. We, we have actually have thousands of resources as well. Uh, nothing works better though for us, uh, we found, than being able to go into the schools or at work uh, hands-on or in, in real time with our, with our educators. That's where we're getting the greatest take up. Um, in terms of online education, well, we've been doing this since 1999, and uh, we work with uh, uh, schools where, uh, in many cases, the uh, number of students don't uh, does not justify the the hiring of a specialist uh, in, in certain subject areas, uh, such as math, uh, some of the advanced math courses, chemistry, physics. Uh, um, and those subjects area areas in particular, and uh, we will offer the class to those students, uh, and we're able to do this once again because uh, our board of directors, made up of uh, uh, the directors general of all the school boards, as well as the uh, the heads of the uh, private school association. So that's our mandate, and uh, I just wanted to highlight some of the things that we do that we're able to do because we are part of a consortium. Thank you, Ed. Well, and with that, I mean, you've, you've seen quite a, quite a range of uh, uh, models from the very, very advanced to the very, very infant or becoming infant. Um, our, our lead uh, researchers at Canny Learn are Randy and Michael, and uh, I think it'd be appropriate for one of them to uh, kind of give that summary of what we're seeing across the, the country from coast to coast. Sure, I, I'll jump in. So, so in terms of some of the, the takeaways, I guess, after all of this is, is trying to make sense of it. And unless you're bouncing around the country and you kind of see it in a, a larger step back uh, as opposed to being in the silos of the provinces, um, that often there's centralized changes that are brought in place, but sometimes and almost all the time to some degree, there's resistance that's met by educators in regional leadership about trying to understand them. And I, you know, we've had a couple of examples in, in Ontario, uh, and, but then things tend to sort out afterwards. Uh, but it's well, and probably a good example is BC right now, is a decentralized practitioner-based changes that have evolved, but sometimes they're not well understood or well, uh, uh, you know, in disgust and, and people are all on the same page because collaboration takes time and 
it generates a lot of confusion from time to time. So sometimes as well, you get diminishing interest, support, and involvement for those who, you know, who have been involved in the change um, as well. So they can collapse um, because of that. But sort of the one thing that is really important, sizable investment, continuous support, training for teachers as well, persistent focus, all of those are really, really important in order to sustain change. And we know that in education. It's a, it's the same so our, a sad story that happens all around. Great ideas brought with great announcements, with great vim and vigor, and then the devils in the details of actually continuing to provide that support uh, until the next big thing comes along and then someone else is going to change the whole world, et cetera. So we have seen that cycle of rise and fall, but at the end of it, really, it lands on the practitioners despite how it happens. It's the practitioners that have to figure this stuff out together and come together in order to do that. That's sort of been the legacy uh, that's occurred in British, I'm sorry, in British Columbia, certainly across Canada. Uh, my experience base in terms of working as a, as a teacher and administrator, and then also with provincial organizations has been in British Columbia. And I see lots of ebbs and tides over my 35, 40 years uh, in, in being involved with that. So uh, Michael, Barber, do you have any comments or comparisons maybe that trigger from your mind with regards to similar experiences in the U.S. and what the differences are? Not specifically, no. I mean, uh, I'm looking at our audience and, you know, the, the six or seven folks that have been joining us and some of the polls that we've had, it seems most folks are just sort of interested in, in how things are rolling out in, in, in Canada. I've been following along with the chat and, uh, other than a couple of specific questions we've had along the way, they've been a relatively quiet group in, in the chat. So I'm not, I'm not sure where we want to take ourselves at this stage. <laughs> well, the, unfortunately, because we would open up the mic and have a very large, you know, roundtable kind of discussion, but we uh, unfortunately couldn't get the the switch from the panel model to just an open meeting model, which we tend to to flourish in because that's really. Um, kind of how we roll in the country, but also how we roll as Candy Learn, just more of a collaborative discussion. So if you want to pop any quick questions that do come to mind along there, to me- Actually, Randy, I yeah. think I've just turned them all on so that they, I, I hit the button to see if it was allowed. And it seems like I've permitted them all to talk. So I don't know if they're in Zoom or not, but at least in the Zoom function, I've- We'll see. Yeah. Grab the mic if you got My guess is they're watching this impassable, so they probably yeah. don't even see that I've I've done that. So there is a link to uh, launch in the Zoom app if you want to get into a discussion with us. Uh, launch in Zoom app uh, right below the screen. I did that in the main session uh, before I jumped into ours as well. I so see Robert has his uh, his mic activated. Ooh. Hi, Robert. Can you hear us? Yeah, I just see. Uh, no yeah, the, I, I don't. I don't know that the app is actually connecting because Pathable controls it, so that might oh, be the, the issue. Yeah, yeah, that's with that. So, regardless, so, I mean, there there is an avenue if you have any questions or things that uh, have have cropped up, or um, if you want more detail on any of these uh, particular places, models, ideas. If there's anything that uh, we haven't expanded on, or more importantly, because I don't get to see the poll results, is there anything that we haven't given you that you really wanted yeah because i'll when we were planning this out we all were on the impression that we'd be in the meeting format here so um that has uh limited our ability to interact with you guys the way in which we were hoping to be able to do yeah so we're still in the webinar zoom piece and pathable grabs different components and manages them within its own environment for this. So uh, even though talking is permitted, I don't know that it's necessarily going to work. So you can text away in there and we'll try and pick up the questions that do come in. Um, but I'm wondering if there's anything else that we want to bring forward at this point in time with the group. 
Uh, the only thing I'll mention is I dropped the link to our emergency remote teaching project that uh, Canny mm -hmm. Learn sponsored into the chat, because I think that's something that um, the audience might find instructive. I know most of our conversation and looking at these consortiums focused upon how they normally operate. And there was some reference to how things may have changed a bit in the pandemic, but that really wasn't our main focus uh, as part of this event. So um, um, that particular aspect I think might be useful. And, and we do have another report coming out probably in the next month or so that looks at, um, so you'll see there are three reports there. One that looked at what happened in the spring of last year when um, we were all scrambling. One that looked at the fall in terms of what was done and planned for the uh, reopening of a new school year. Uh, around Christmas, we did a third report that was designed to get um, stakeholder perspectives from the, the field uh, for everything from students to parents to teachers to school leaders to superintendents uh, and other folks on the, the school district level, um, a mixture of both face-to-face -face folks and online and blended folks. Uh, and we're doing a fourth report now that's looking at essentially what actually played out during the 2020-21 school year. And uh, you, well, you heard Todd, at, for example, mention that they've been closed three times throughout the school year. So one of the things that that fourth report will look at is sort of what happened in each time and the dates and the resources that were put in to place during that period of time. Um, and other than that, I'm just kind of filling a bit of time, Randy showing it there on the screen um, until we get a couple of questions from the folks in the yeah. audience. Okay, not seeing much of anything. Um, folks, we did have a few folks jump in and then jump out and I'm not, uh, yeah, nothing more in the poll. So we're here for questions, I guess. We ended a little bit early, but that uh, I think there's another session that might be going on for the last 15 minutes as well, that maybe a few folks have wandered off to. So thank you all for being here and being a part of this. And I, for those of you that are watching on the recording, so we're the Canadian eLearning Network and I can go back and put up the first slide so that you have the contact information. Yeah, we're getting a thank you or two in the Pathable chat. And uh, awesome. So I, I don't think there are any questions, although we will continue to hang out for the next, I guess, 15 and a half minutes or so in case folks do have questions. And hopefully, people in uh, the Pathable session have noticed that there are a couple of uh, polls within the uh, uh, session that were added by DLAC. Um, three short questions to share your feedback about the session and uh, to receive PD hours for attending DLAC 2021. Um, you're certainly welcome to log out of the session and log into your next event, or we will see you, most of us will be around on Monday, June 14th to, to wander around. So please feel free to engage as you feel, uh, feel free or feel fit. And uh, thank you and enjoy the rest of DLAC. And speaking of the 15th and 16th, um, for those folks that may be interested, we do have uh, a couple of other sessions that uh, are a little bit more focused. Uh, there's a, um, a contributed talk that we have on the State of the Nation research uh, that's happening in virtual N7. And then there's also a um, the uh, this emergency remote teaching part that uh, project that Randy was just showing uh, will be on the 16th. Um, uh, it's 8.30 my time, which is in California. So I guess that's 9.30 in Austin. Is it? Are they on Mountain? No, 2. 2. 10.30. 10 10.30. Okay, so 10.30. Um, so if you are interested in either of those topics, and as I understand it, those will be more in the meeting format. So uh, it'll allow a little bit more back and forth than what we've been able to do here. Thanks, all.